What's going on, beautiful people? It is I, your flying locomotive and faster than a speeding bullet supercliff, coming at you live with a brand new video. And for today's spectacular video, we are finally at the finish line. We are hitting up the finale to the World World Saga, that being Philip Kennedy Johnson's Superman World World Apocalypse issue number one. But before we get into the finale of War World, Superman, The Authority, and the fate of the entire DC Universe, if you are new to the channel, then smash that like and subscribe button. That way you guys never miss out on anything that's happening on this majestic channel. And because we've managed to cross over a thousand subs, let's raise the bar and go full on Super Saiyan as we try to get 200 more subs before the end of 2022. Thus, without further ado, let's dive into the finale of the glorious War World Saga. Our story starts off with Mongols forces breaching the rebel camp's defenses. Armies compiled of death and destruction. Forces that are being spearheaded by Mongols champions, Apollo, Black Razor, and Omak. However, despite the fact that Superman's revolution is severely outnumbered and totally outpowered, none of this is swaying away the forces of good, because we have ourselves here a heroic Midnighter, providing our troops with a morale speech, because at the end of the day, Mongol is only doing this because he is afraid. For the villain is so desperate for the victory that he is willing to level his own cities to achieve that W. Basically, don't be afraid because we know that he's afraid of us. Thus, the revolution cheers out loud the unblooded sword for Superman. Elsewhere within the Necropolis, we pick up where we last left off with the Man of Steel, where it was revealed that it was Krillix Ux, who was the cloaked individual who's been advising Mongol this entire time. He was the one who basically urged Mongol to attack Earth, the one who was the catalyst to the War World Saga. And now with Superman in possession of the Fire of Algrim, we have Mongol threatening the children unless Superman does what he says and gives him the fire. Now Superman is like, okay dude, just chill. You know, I'm not going to sacrifice children for some stupid magic fire. However, before anything can happen, Osla Ra, one of the kids, orders Superman to not give in. And from there, the child attacks Mongol. And because Mongol is a bad guy, he strikes the child down, thus killing him. But this only opens up a can of whoop ass because if there's one thing that you shouldn't do is that you shouldn't kill a child like literally right in front of Superman. Because as we are about to see, the final battle between Mongol and Superman begins. The fate of War World begins. Elsewhere within the Star Forge of Engine City 1, we pick up with Natasha Irons and the war zone Leonef getting overpowered by the mechanical darling and with the teacher's forces quartering our heroes, things are looking pretty dicey. But that is until Natasha takes out the orphan and with its powers, the little baby in a jar literally obliterates the soldiers with a massive wave of energy. And despite the teacher trying to escape, the mighty infant straight up destroys him as revenge for the teacher's experiments conducted on it and the darling. Thus with the teacher dead, the darling begins to revert back to the orphan's control. From there, we switch back to the front lines, where the main battle is taking place between War World and the Revolution. Now, Midnighter is trying his damnedest to somehow connect with Apollo because he's trying to break his lover away from Mongol's control. But that's where Manchester Black steps in to inform Midnighter that Apollo doesn't know who he is. He's basically a puppet mate, and the reason for this is because the teacher's a freak, and he planted neural implants through his nervous system. Basically, he's being programmed to follow orders. So the only way to save him is to get the implants out of Apollo. But the only problem is that Apollo's skin isn't like most regular people's. Rather, he's got something similar to Marvel's Luke Cage, that being unbreakable skin. Meanwhile, we continue on with Superman and Mongol duking it out. And not only is he facing off Mongol, but Supes is also taking on Krillix Ux, his former ally. Now it's here where Superman recalls back to the storyteller Bayesh about how he told him the story of the fire of Algren and that it wasn't just something of strength, but that of life. And with that, Superman runs over to the dead body of Osla Ra and stabs him with a dagger, alas, bringing the dead boy back to life. Now Mongol is pretty much shocked because he cannot believe that Superman would waste such power in order to save a single person. But that's when Superman tells the villain that, you know, if you can't understand why I do the things I do, then that's why you can never win. So get up, Mongol, and face me like a man. Now, returning back to the main battle, with Apollo kicking everyone's ass, including Midnighters, 
that's when all of a sudden we see the arrival of the Justice League. And so this is where Apollo starts to freak out because the tides have clearly turned. And when you have someone like Cyborg who's being weird and is doing some weird shit to your spine, chances are it's going to freak someone out. And that's exactly what it does as we see Apollo grab his spine to where we see Cyborg inject him with something within. And from there, Apollo rips out Cyborg's arm. But rather what really happens was that Apollo, he actually ripped out the spinal implants within his spine, thereby making himself free of Mungle's control. And it turns out the Justice League weren't even there, for it was merely an illusion injected by Manchester Black as a way to infect Apollo's mind in order to get him to rip the stuff out of him since his skin is just way too strong. But wait, because there's more good news to come, because this is where we finally see the redemption arc of Omak come into play because Omak has finally realized that what he's doing is just wrong and that the Black Racer isn't Laia. It isn't the person he knew. It's something completely else. And now he is willing to make amends for his betrayal. Omak is back, folks. Returning back to the Starforge chamber, it's made aware that the heroes can't actually enter the chamber, place the Genesis device, because it will end up killing anyone who enters. But seeing that his wounds are deep and that he's, you know, already dying, the Warzone Lenoff is willing to make the sacrifice. And that the only thing he asks for in return is a hand job. I mean, um, <laughs> whoa. Um, no. The, the one thing he asks for in return is time. Time enough for him to do what must be done. And with that, Leonov bids his farewell as he enters the chamber. And it's here where we have a heroic sacrifice, for Leonov is able to place the Genesis into the chamber, thus causing an explosion, and with it, a wave of energy begins to cover all of Warworld. Thus, we see the Philogians becoming imbued with their Kryptonian powers due to Warworld's now exposed red sun. And alas, the battle is saved. However, this causes Black Racer to run over to Engine City 1, sort of as a last attempt to stop the good guys from achieving victory. But Omak teleports himself after her. And after being able to grab Black Racer, Omak drags her into the Star Forge, where the Genesis energy purges Mother's Darkness from Leah. But sadly, as a result of this, Omak dies in Lila's hands. But at least Omak was able to save his lover from death. But that's not the only cathartic good thing that's happening, because picking back up with Soups, we see our hero getting himself a massive upgrade. And with Superman's powers back at full strength, he starts beating the crap out of Mongol. He starts punching and lasering the crap out of the tyrants of Warworld. However, Superman and the Rebels aren't the only ones with an upgrade, because it's here where we see Krillix Ux, whom after gaining super strength from the Genesis, rips the wounded Mongol's heart right out of his body, immediately killing him, earning himself a fatality. Now within the Necropolis, Krillix Ux tells Superman and children that he needed the fire of Algren to kill Mongol for revenge for what he did to his family. And so he manipulated both Mongol and Superman to obtain the fire, thus sacrificing hundreds of his own people for revenge, which is pretty terrible. Now from there, he takes Mongol's orphan box and tells Supes that, you know, there are others who need my help and there are others who need to pay for the destruction of New Philosia. And with having now the powers of Superman, he believes he can destroy them without the fire. Thus, Krillix Ux teleports away, telling Superman that he saw him as a friend and hopes that they can still be that. Weeks later, we pick up of Lord Premier Pharos, the slimy politician who secretly helped Mongol, and he receives a call on the secret communication channel that Mongol uses to contact him. However, it's to his shock that it's not Mongol, but rather it's Krillix Ux, and he tells Pharos that Mongol is dead and that he is now the leader of the Warzone tribes. And so he reveals that when the previous Mongol attacked New Philosia, the Philosians appealed to Pharos, who was back then a young senator for Sanctuary. But of course, Tharos handed them over to Mongol instead, clearly for power. And though Tharos is, you know, trying to deny it, Krillix Ux straight up tells him, like Tony Soprano, that he will wreak vengeance on Pharos and the United Planets. Ooh. And of course, our comic, the epic conclusion to the Warwell Saga, concludes in Metropolis, where we see Lois Lane writing a story. But suddenly, out of nowhere, Miss Lane is swooped up from her office only to be taken up into the skies of the greatest city imaginable, as we see both Lois and Superman share a romantic kiss. Because Superman, the Man of Steel, is back, folks. Superman has returned back to Earth. And that, folks, was the end of Superman War World Apocalypse, issue number one. And thank you guys for checking out my video, as it truly, truly means the world to me. Ask and you shall receive. 
And that's exactly what Mr. Philip Kennedy Johnson does with this one shot. One of the things that needs to be said is that whenever it comes to finales, whether it's a show, a comic, or a movie, most of the time, we the consumer often feel the sense of rushness that's happening. And I think many of us can relate, especially when it comes to the Marvel TV shows on Disney+, Plus, along with last issues of a long-term comic book arc. A Superman story that comes to mind is back in Bendis' Superman. Bendis is coming. The last issue of The Man of Steel confronting the villainous royal czar, that issue in particular felt extremely rushed because it seemed Bendis was just trying to get to the Legion of Superheroes as fast as he could without really addressing the status quo of the Rogel Czar. And yeah, I know, no one gives a fuck about Rogel Czar, but Bendis did focus on that character for like 20 issues. So yeah, I don't know, at least give us a proper ending for him. After all, it was revealed that he was Kryptonian. All I'm saying is bring back Rogel Czar. <laughs> Anyways, uh, <laughs> but yeah, fortunately that is not the case for this issue, which is why I appreciate the finale being a 50 page one shot. It's able to end the story that we've been so invested with Action Comics for the past year and a half, doing it in a way that is satisfying, yet still pushing forward the, piece, the pieces. Mungle getting killed, Superman returning back to Lois, Omax sacrificing for Light Ray. I think the only thing that wasn't covered is what's happening on Earth with regards to Steel and the Source Tablet. But with Johnson still being on the book because, you know, I asked him, I have no doubt that the next story will continue those uncomplete story threads. But yeah, I am psyched. I love the story, but I also think it's bittersweet with the audience because I think it's time to, you know, let Superman return home. You know, let the Man of Steel come back to his home turf in Metropolis. So yeah, as always, I'm your majestic sayer of words, Supercliff. And if you guys are new to the channel, then do me a solid by smashing that like and subscribe button. That way you guys never miss out on anything that's happening on this lovely and majestic channel. And also the notification bell so that you'll never miss out on an upload. So that you'll always be kept up to date with your favorite top tier comics happening in the comic book world. Now tell me, what are your thoughts and opinions on this issue? Are you guys excited for the continuation with issue number 1047? Also, who do you want villain wise to be given the Philip Kennedy Johnson treatment for the next story? Are we thinking a Brainiac story or perhaps a Metallo one? Let me know down in the comment section below. And until the next video, peace. Giggity goo.